Hello and welcome to this webinar on the management of gunshot injuries, which is brought to you by ESTES, the European Society for Trauma and Emergency Surgery. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our colleagues in the Ukraine who are watching this webinar, and particularly our friends in the Pan-Ukrainian Association for Traumatology and Osteosynthesis. I hope this webinar will be useful for you. If other viewers can provide practical help to our Ukrainian colleagues in the form of VAC dressings, XFIX, headlights if possible with their own self-contained energy supply, basic dressing materials or chest tubes, it will be very greatly appreciated. And I'll put up an address for you to send this material at the end of the webinar. Our expert panel today will be addressing the topic of gunshot injuries and their management, with particular reference to injuries to the trunk, management of long bone fractures, and how to handle articular fractures. So I'm gonna hand over now to my colleague and co-moderator, Chris Pappy, to take it from here and to introduce the first topic, Chris. At the time when we were planning this, uh, we were kind of wondering uh, what the topic should be precisely. After all, this is the polytrauma section that um, is involved uh, from Estes, from the Estes side. So initially we felt like, oh, maybe we should uh, include stab wounds or some other uh, open injuries as well. And then uh, we kind of narrowed it down to a gunshot. And uh, who would have known that uh, history kind of bypassed us and uh, currently it is a very uh, topic that is of, uh, of high re relevance, at least in Europe. Um, when you look at the speakers, um, you would think, okay, these are three people from various uh, uh, areas of the world. But uh, if you look a little closer, you, and uh, I think during the talks, you will find out that uh, some of them have worked in, diff in, in various places. Um, and uh, they have uh, quite some experience um, with uh, different topics. So let us focus on the injuries uh, to the trunk at first. And uh, I uh, would like to uh, ask Valentin Neuhaus to, to share his screen. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, dear Professor Pope, dear Professor Tilset, uh, dear friends and colleagues, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about gunshot injuries and their management. And I will uh, start about injuries to the trunk. Now, in the past, it was a clear dogma, all penetrating wounds mandated uh, surgical exploration. Nowadays, it's a more sophisticated, maybe operative, maybe non-operative treatment. Operative treatment, surgical exploration can be negative, unnecessary, and non-therapeutic. It can have complications. With a non-operative approach, you can have a uh, maybe a shorter length of stay, less complications, less cost. However, you are facing sometimes undiagnosed uh, injuries, which can be frightening. So in the next uh, 15 minutes, I will uh, talk about epidemiology. And we'll talk about resource room, trauma principles, uh, penetrating chest and abdominal injuries. Now we uh, know interpersonal and intrapersonal uh, violence. On the left side, a typical patient from the Grote Skur, interpersonal. And on the right side, you see a typical patient from my hospital here in Zurich, which was a suicidal attempt. Uh, we all know the acronym MIST, uh, Mechanism, Injuries, uh, Signs and Treatment. This acronym helps us to triage patients depending on the trauma mechanism or the injuries or the vital signs. We send the patient into a resource room. Here you can see from the German society uh, a table showing us that patients with a penetrating injury to the neck, chest, or abdomen should be triaged to the resource room. Uh, 
The idea of the resource room is to identify and treat life-threatening injuries as fast as possible in the golden hour to reduce the mortality. We need to supply oxygen to the vital organs and one safe way is uh, the advanced trauma life support ABCDE algorithm. Airway must be clear, lung must be both air entry on both sides to avoid hypoxia. We need to have a good cardiac output to avoid hyperperfusion, good disability and environment. We must avoid the hypothermia. If we do this, we get a better outcome. Now, these are the typical uh, life-threatening injuries. We are hunting for the tension pneumothorax, which needs to be decompressed. The massive hemothorax, which needs to be drained. And sometimes we need to do a surgical exploration to stop the bleeding. The cardiac tamponade, which needs to be opened and the cardiac wound fixed. The massive bleeding, especially in the abdomen, which needs to be stopped with some uh, different maneuvers. Uh, we will talk about it. And the contamination, which is uh, a hollow viscous uh, injury, which needs to be closed up. For all uh, patients with a penetrating trauma, it's uh, important to have clear algorithms. And all these patients uh, need also some distinct adjuncts. One good way is uh, the Lodox, a low dose X ray to get a chest X ray and also a whole body X ray to see bullets, uh, bullet markers. Uh, you clearly can see uh, a massive hemothorax or some air in uh, different areas of the body. We also do a um, uh, lab value. Uh, blood work, uh, work up um, the, the blood gas analysis. We are looking for the metabolic uh, lactate acidosis, the hemoglobin level, and uh, a type and screen especially. In, uh, it's very helpful to have uh, bullet markers. On the left, you see this patient with the bullet markers on the abdomen and on the right arm which afterwards can be clearly seen on uh, this, the, 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 the X-ray on uh, the right side. Um, it gives you a clear idea of the trajectory. And if you know the trajectory, you can assume what kind of injuries do we encounter. While looking at this picture, it's also important to talk about the intercoastal drainage. Uh, the output can be very helpful to guide you the treatment, which cavity first needs to be explored. In more stable patients, uh, we usually uh, do a CT scan um, with the IV contrast to, to get clear bullet tracts and injured organs and active bleeding sites. Now, if we talk about uh, chest injury, it's uh, if it's unilateral, it's usually quite uh, simple to treat and to diagnose. It can be clearly seen on X-rays or on CT scans. And the treatment usually consists of an uh, ICD, uh, intercostal drainage, and uh, chest physio. Um, we are looking for a massive hemothorax, meaning more than 1.5 liters of blood which needs a thoracotomy. We are looking for ongoing blood loss, uh, more than 200 milliliters per hour for the next four hours, which also usually needs a thoracotomy. The persistent air leakage or a retained hemothorax, which needs further diagnostic workup and maybe a thoracoscopy to treat these injuries. While a unilateral uh, gunshot wound to the chest can be quite easily managed. It's completely different with uh, cardiac injuries. If we look at uh, penetrating cardiac injury, and uh, if we think about the mortality, how high is the mortality? So 
the mortality is nearly 90%. And it's usually pre-hospital or already deadly, the gunshot to the heart. Uh, Prof. Nickel uh, uh, from uh, the Grotesque Hospital and his team published quite a lot of uh, important uh, studies about uh, chest and cardiac injuries. And they came up with uh, this algorithm, which is uh, very helpful. So patients with uh, a, a cardiac uh, injury, they can present with three distinct uh, identities, either a cardiac arrest, unstable or stable. If a patient is uh, in cardiac arrest, it's usually within uh, uh, the last 15 minutes, then we can proceed with an emergency department thoracotomy. The idea of the emergency department thoracotomy on the left side is to release the pericardial tamponade and repair the cardiac wound. Good thing about an EDT is that you can control major intrathoracic and intrapulmonary bleeding. And you could also do a cross clamping of the descending aorta to improve the blood supply to the heart and to the brain. After an EDT, it needs a thorough washout in uh, the theater. The next uh, identity would be the unstable patient or patient with a cardiac tamponade with the full-blown uh, back uh, triad. These patients, uh, unstable means if the BP is less than 90 and uh, tachycardic patients after maximum one to two liters of crystalloid, then we say the patient is unstable. And patient who is unstable with the cardiac uh, penetrating injury needs a sternotomy to open up the uh, pericardial sac and repair the heart wound. For stable patient, it's uh, very helpful to, to read the, the, the randomized prospective study from Professor Nickel. In the past, it was clear that the patient with a penetrating wound to the heart um, and a, a pericardial effusion needs a sternotomy. With that study, they could show that it's sufficient to do a subsifoidal uh, window, subsifi, and to see if there is blood, then we say the, the, the subsif is positive. And we are looking for active bleeding. As soon as we have active bleeding, the patient needs a stenotomy. Transmediastinal gunshot wound are uh, rather deadly. Um, quite often it's fatal pre-hospital. If patient arrive in the hospital, and they are unstable, it's usually because of the cardiac injury and the algorithm for the cardiac injury I just showed you. If the patient is stable, we need uh, quite a thorough workup with the echo of the heart, a CT angio of the great vessels. We need uh, some imaging modalities of the esophagus. This can be either esophagoscopy or a contrast dye esophagography and a bronchoscopy to see what is injured and then plan uh, the, the, the further surgical uh, exploration. Now we continue with the penetrating abdominal injury. Um, it's always the dilemma having a negative laparotomy which can be an important cause of complications. Or if we don't do the laparotomy, having unrecognized or untreated abdominal injury as an important cause of death. And if we think about the gunshot wounds to the abdomen, if the peritoneum is uh, breached, we usually have 100% uh, intra-abdominal any intra-abdominal organ injured. And if we think about the numbers, which organs are usually affected, it's, it's helpful to, to think about the anatomy, get the, the, the picture of the abdomen and think about the bullet tract and, and uh, 
see. And if we, we look at all the numbers, we usually have about 50% small and 40% large bowel injured. They usually present with a peritonitis. In about 30%, the liver is injured because it's quite big. And in 25%, the vessels. Injuries to these two uh, identities, they usually cause a, a hemodynamic problem. So this is, uh, for example, a patient with a gunshot to the left upper quadrant, and uh, he had an injury to the colon, an injury to the jejunum, then also uh, to the kidney, to the suprarenal gland and the pancreas. Now the treatment of uh, these injuries, it's uh, small and large bowel can usually be primary repaired if less than 50% of the bowel wall is affected. If more than 50% of the bowel wall is affected, we usually need to do a resection and the primary anastomosis if the patient is stable enough. For the liver, we need uh, to, to be aware of the push, pack and Pringle technique. With these uh, techniques, we usually get uh, uh, over all, uh, most of the liver injuries. And with the vessels, we usually have the ligate repair and shunt technique, which can help us. But we must be aware of which vessels can be ligated or not. In the past, uh, a gunshot wound usually uh, mandated a prompt laparotomy. And uh, if we think about how many unnecessary laparotomies were done, um, it's about five to 30%. Unnecessary means it's negative or non-therapeutic, and especially gunshot wounds to the flank and to the back uh, ended up in uh, quite a lot of unnecessary laparotomy. One of uh, the largest study about gunshot uh, injuries to the abdomen was presented by Pradeep Navsarya. He's uh, at the Grote Skur with Prof Andy Nickel and uh, Sori Nedu. That's a fantastic team. I had the chance to join them and, and see how they do it. And their algorithm is um, if a patient has an abdominal gunshot wound and if he's unstable, so systolic BP of less than 90 or peritonitic, they did a laparotomy. If the patient was stable, not peritonitic and neurologically intact, so we can do an abdominal observation, he was admitted to a high care unit and observed for at least 24 hours uh, with serial physical examination, regular hemoglobin level, uh, uh, measurements. And as soon as the patient developed peritoneal signs, hemodynamic instability, fever, or leukocytosis, the patient uh, was transferred to the operation room. And if we look at day numbers, they, they analyzed more than 1,000 gunshot wounds. So three or four patients underwent a laparotomy. It was unnecessary in 3.5% and the mortality was 7%. And uh, I, I must add the, the information that they didn't do a uh, abdominal ultrasound. They just looked at hemodynamic stability, peritonitic abdomen and neurologically examination if it was possible or not. If we look at uh, the non-operative part, it was successful in 95% and the mortality rate, length of stay and the complication rate was quite low. From that study, we learned that uh, quite a lot of the right upper quadrant gunshot wound can be treated non-operative, especially if the patient is hemodynamic stable and not peritonitic. One uh, word about the, the priorities, about the timing, I said uh, do a primary anastomosis. Um, it's the cold, uh, acidotic and coagulopathic patient, which is a problem. And uh, we, 
we call a hypothermia less than 35 degrees, uh, acidosis uh, with a pH of less than 7.2 and the lactate of more than five uh, as uh, parameters uh, asking for a damage control procedure. In a damage control procedure, we just staple off uh, the injured uh, bowels and we just uh, pack the liver and put an abdominal vac uh, into it and get the patient back to um, the theater after an intensive care unit stabilization of 24 to 48 hours. However, if the patient is stable, has no inotropic support, good urine output, we can proceed and do the, the primary anastomosis. So in summary, we quickly talked about the inter and intrapersonal violence. The MIST acronym, Mechanism Injury Science and Treatment can help to triage a patient into the resource room. We usually start with uh, one safe way with ATLS, A, B, C, D, E, and hunt for the typical life-threatening injuries. We talked about the algorithm of uh, penetrating chest injuries with the three identities, cardiac arrest, uh, then we need to do an emergency department thoracotomy, an unstable patient usually needs a sternotomy, and the stable patient we recommend to do a subsifi window to see if there is active bleeding. For the penetrating abdominal injury, it's the unstable and peritonitic patient which needs a laparotomy and the stable, not peritonitic and neurologically intact patient can be admitted and observed. Thank you very much. I hope I gave you some short overview. Thank you very much. There was a lot of information. <clears throat> There's uh, one question from the audience uh, so far, and uh, they wanted to know um, if you have to do a tractectomy, um, and uh, do you have to actually um, have a look? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't see the, the, the question, but the question was if I would do a tractectomy uh, of uh, the lung. Yes, exactly. Ah, okay. So um, most of the gunshot injuries to the uh, chest, if it's unilateral, do not need a tractotomy. Um, but as soon as we open up the chest, uh, that means uh, doing a thoracotomy in case of massive bleeding, ongoing blood loss, then we would also uh, fix the lung injury, but uh, not... Uh, at the beginning. And uh, just to complete, uh, would you recommend uh, if you if you see that there's a, a wound, uh, let's say the oxygenation is not uh, not too bad, um, would you recommend to do a chest tube first, or do you uh, do you schedule the, the patient for a thoracotomy immediately? No, no. There is uh, very rarely an indication to proceed directly with the thoracotomy. First step also in an emergency department thoracotomy would be a chest tube on both sides to uh, maybe there is a tension pneumothorax or something like that. But the chest tube, that's uh, number one uh, for gunshot injuries to the chest. Okay. Now we have two more questions. One of them is, uh, is there any role or indication for a diagnostic laparotomy uh, in abdominal gunshot injuries? Now, um, if this, the patient is unstable and peritonitic, we usually go directly with a laparotomy. Uh, we had one special indication for a diagnostic laparoscopy this is a gunshot wound to the pelvis with a positive uh, rectoscopy showing that there is a rectal injury. In these cases, if the patient is hemodynamic, stable and not peritonitic, we can do a, a diagnostic laparoscopy to show that the rectal injury is 
extra or intraperitoneal. Uh, I assume if the patient is not peritonitic, it would be extra peritoneal. Then he could do a sigmoid loop a colostomy, but otherwise it's uh, especially in gunshot wound. I don't see a lot of indications for diagnostic laparoscopy. In uh, stab wounds, it's a little bit different maybe. Okay, so here's one more question, uh, and it is about the diagnostics. Um, the, so if no ultrasound is done and CT is also not used, uh, do you think it, uh, it depends on the type of institution and you may find uh, variable results? Now, the, the algorithm about the gunshot wound to the abdomen is just based on clinical parameters. And uh, uh, it is clear that we usually do a CT scan. And um, also in the algorithm uh, presented by Professor Navsario is mentioned that if you want to do a non operative treatment, it's advisable to have a CT scan to clearly show that there is the stomach, duodenum, small and large bowel not affected, and the tract is really a way of the hollow viscous injuries, and there is no active bleeding. It's uh, uh, an, an ultrasound doesn't help to see these uh, injuries. If there is a little bit of fluid um, and the patient would be hemodynamic stable, they would just uh, observe the patient. So the ultrasound does not help a lot. The ultrasound does help, especially for the pericardial tamponade and the, the hemothorax uh, to the distinguish left and right side, uh, which uh, cavity needs to be first treated. There it can be helpful. All right, any uh, ideas from Jonathan? No, I don't think I have anything to add to that, Chris. Okay. So I guess we covered uh, all the answers for, for the injuries to the trunk. Thank you again for your fantastic talk. And Thank we can you. now move on to the long bone fracture with Professor Zell uh, from Texas. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and I greatly appreciate the invitation to be part of this panel on gunshot injuries. And uh, may I ask, are my slides uh, visible on the screen? Yes? Yes, they are. And you're, we can hear you loud and clear. OK. Thank you. I'm Boris Zell from the University of Texas in San Antonio. I'm the Chief of Trauma and Vice Chair of Research within our department. And again, I greatly appreciate uh, the invitation and the opportunity to be part of this panel. I work out of uh, the University Hospital in San Antonio, which is a big level one trauma center. Uh, we see about uh, more than 80,000 ER visits per year and more than 4,500 trauma admissions per year. We also a county facility and with that, we certainly get a wide spectrum of uh, different injuries and see different population populations. And part of uh, what we do uh, take care of a lot is gunshot injuries uh, that present to our emergency department. And I would like to start with a case presentation. This is a 36-year-old male patient who was assaulted with a handgun. Uh, he presented as an isolated injury to the uh, left lower extremity. Uh, he was neurovascularly intact with palpable uh, peripheral pulses a normal motor exam with EHR and FHR will impact a normal sensation. And over the next couple of minutes, we will discuss uh, how we can manage this uh, individual. I would also like to present some demographic data from the United States and from our hospital. So firearm-related deaths uh, in the United States are still relatively common, and we account approximately 45,000 uh, per year. That's 120 per day. Uh, across the country. This is all data from the uh, Center for Disease Control. Uh, out of those, 60% uh, uh, are suicides, approximately 30% are homicides. 
And we've seen a 75% increase since 2011, and actually a relatively sharp increase of 14% uh, from uh, 2019. The firearm injuries that are more getting the attention of the orthopedic surgeon are apparently the non-fatal firearm injuries. And in 2020, uh, we saw approximately 71,000, uh, which is approximately 200 per day across uh, the nation. And the majority of those are assault injuries. Approximately 20% are uh, unintentional and a number of them uh, certainly uh, intentional. And here again, we saw a 40% increase over the last uh, five years, uh, showing how the numbers are trending up uh, in the United States. And this is also uh, probably uh, further um, shown by the numbers from our hospital. And it also shows a little bit uh, that we are expecting to see further sharp increases um, that are probably also related to the pandemic. Yeah. So if you look at the uh, graph on the left, 2019, let's look at the number of assault firearm injuries and compare that to 2020 and uh, 2021. Uh, during the pandemic, we've seen significant increases, increases that are uh, much higher than the, actually the growth within the San Antonio population. So uh, the pandemic is probably contributing a little bit to this phenomenon. When we talk about gunshot injuries uh, to the long bones, but also gunshot injuries in general, I think a big distinction uh, from the clinical standpoint is um, that we have to distinguish between low velocity and high velocity injuries, whereby the low velocities are less than 2,000 feet per second. And uh, understanding the ballistics a little bit, the tissue damage is a result of the kinetic energy, energy transfer, um, which is proportional to the square of the velocity. So high velocity uh, gunshot injuries uh, have significantly more soft tissue damage and create damage uh, over an area of several uh, centimeters around uh, the uh, bullet. Whereas low velocity damage is typically restricted clearly to the bullet path. Another thing that we have to uh, be aware of is that retained bullets, they transfer all of their energy to the surrounding tissues, tissues whereas exiting bullets uh, only um, account for partial transfer of the bullet energy. So uh, understanding the ballistics a little bit also gives us an idea about the assessment of these patients. So high velocity versus low velocity. So the picture on the left is a left um, radial shaft fracture as a result of a shotgun injury. The picture on the right is a similar radial shaft fracture uh, that is the result of a handgun injury. So here we clearly see that the picture on the left is a high velocity injury where we can see by the surrounding uh, soft tissue uh, shadows as the involvement of the tissues, whereas the picture on the right is a low velocity injury. So uh, looking at the soft tissues, this is what the difference is. The high velocity is associated with significant soft tissue trauma, whereas the low velocity it's a localized uh, entrance and exit wound. And following surgical debridement, the high velocity ultimately look like this. And when we also look at the uh, further workup, we, uh, at our hospital, we have a relatively low threshold to get a CT angiogram uh, on most gunshot injuries. So, and have in mind that for forearm injuries, uh, the, the rate of associated neurovascular injuries is fairly close to 100%. So a high velocity injury resulted in a complete transection of the brachial artery injury of the brachial artery, complete transaction of the median nerve, complete transaction of the posterior interosseous nerve, and the patient also had no other nerve function. Whereas uh, the low velocity injury uh, resulted in a median nerve injury, the ulnar artery was ligated, but there was still a uh, pattern flow through the radial artery as is also indicated here on the CT angiogram. Well, ultimately, a high velocity injury, despite several efforts and multiple debridements, uh, resulted in, a, uh, in an amputation, whereas a low velocity injury under surgical reconstruction was bridge plating and the patient is awaiting a bone grafting procedure. And the median nerve was also reconstructed through a nerve graft procedure. 
high velocity versus low velocity injuries are completely different animals. Other general considerations, the initial evaluation, and uh, as we just heard by uh, Dr. Neuhaus, we follow the ATLS guidelines. And very important is uh, a thorough new vascular exam, in particular when we're talking about injuries to the long bones. Uh, again, have in mind that for forearm injuries, uh, the risk of neovascular injuries is near 100% for high velocity gunshot injuries. And again, at our institution, we have a relatively low threshold to get a CT angiogram. And when looking at CT angiograms, uh, what we also have to uh, be aware of, this is a fairly low involved um, study to get. So uh, as compared to conventional angiography, the CT angiogram just requires a peripheral injection um, of the IV dye versus a groin line that a conventional angiography would require. It also allows for rapid acquisition uh, versus a procedure that uh, would be um, conducted by the interventional radiologist. It has also a relatively low dose of IV dye. It is cost efficient as compared to conventional angiography and uh, very sensitive and specific. So at our institution, a CT angiogram, uh, when in doubt, uh, we obtain it. Uh, given the relatively quick availability and the relatively low risk procedure. Other con general considerations, bullet removal. So the general recommendation is that uh, we should uh, remove symptomatic uh, bullets that are in the subcutaneous tissue, uh, whereas exploration of um, fragment of uh, exploration for fragment removal of bullets that are deep and retained within the tissues is typically not uh, recommended. And here, an example. This is a 26-year-old male patient. He was assaulted uh, with a handgun. And um, it presented itself as an isolated injury to the left lower extremity. And he uh, was overall um, neurovascularly um, well-maintained with a good uh, DP pulse. He had a faint PT pulse. Uh, he had normal uh, motor and neurologic exam, except for, except for some uh, diffuse numbness or tingling in the foot. Please appreciate that there are two uh, bullet fragments uh, in his leg. So that was a, an injury that, where the bullet um, entered the leg uh, posteriorly. Uh, one bullet seems to be fairly close to the subcutaneous tissue anteriorly, whereas the other bullet uh, seems to be more uh, deeper within the tissues. The CT angiogram, again, confirmed that the patient had head and flow through the uh, posterior tibial artery, so no need for any vascular interventions. But the CT angio also showed us that uh, one bullet was really sitting right within the subcutaneous tissue, whereas the other bullet was sitting posterior uh, to the anterior neovascular bundle, posterior to the anterior muscle compartment. So ulti ultimately, um, the subcutaneous bullet was removed and it was felt that the bullet that was deep and retained posterior to the neovascular bundle uh, would not uh, benefit from removal given the risk benefit uh, ratio in this case. And this patient underwent intramedullary nerve fixation and bullet removal. Other general consideration, risk of infection. So with low velocity uh, gunshot injuries, we typically treat them like closed fractures. So no formal irrigation and debridement procedure and standard uh, perioperative antibiotics. Whereas high velocity injuries are typically treated like grade three open fractures with aggressive surgical irrigation and debridement and antibiotics as per institutional open fracture uh, protocol. So, um, but I will say that in my personal experience, low velocity gunshot injuries, I can't quite uh, confirm that the risk of infection is similar to closed fractures. Uh, I do see um, a probably slightly increase of uh, rates of infection for low velocity gunshot injuries, even though we do not proceed with formal irrigation and debridement. So this is a 19 year old male patient who was involved in a shooting, he was shot by the police and arrested. Um, and uh, he was shot by the police. That was a handgun injury. And he presented with this just a femur fracture. He underwent intramedullary nail fixation. 
And four months after surgery, he presented uh, with a draining sinus and with elevated infectious markers. So subsequently, this patient had to undergo formal uh, irrigation and debridement of the infection, uh, removal of the nail, placement of an external fixator, placement of an antibiotic nail, uh, which uh, was uh, followed uh, by long-term antibiotics, application of the big line, he drew out MRSA. And upon completion of the antibiotic treatment course, he was uh, then converted uh, from the external fixator and the antibiotic nail. Uh, again, uh, to a regular naming procedure, as it was felt that the infection was ultimately uh, cleared. So again, um, low-velocity gunshot injuries, we typically do not proceed with a formal irrigation and debridement, yet um, I, in my personal anecdotal experience, uh, there is um, a risk of infection that is uh, observed. Surgical reconstruction. So what all of these gunshot injuries have in common and they affect the lung bones, uh, we always see significant segmental bone loss or significant segmental comminution. And uh, this is essentially inevitable given the amount of energy imparted on the bone. And um, for this reason, uh, we typically gravitate towards um, restoring length, alignment, and rotation, indirect reduction, we are typically leaning on bridge planning constructs and intramedullary nail uh, fixation constructs. And uh, one uh, point that I would like to make regarding the restoration of links alignment and rotation, frequently uh, the area where the uh, bullet is impacting the bone, low velocity and high velocity, uh, there's no cortical read uh, for any length. So they're typically a radio park ruler. In my hands is a good tool uh, where we measure off the contralateral side uh, intraoperatively uh, the length of the contralateral uninjured bone and uh, try to recreate the length uh, on the uh, injured side as was done here. And this patient who had a, a high velocity injury to the distal femur uh, underwent in damage control fashion uh, application of an external fixator and subsequently, when she underwent bridge plating uh, fixation of the metaphyseal defect, a radiopark ruler was utilized. And again, direct reductions uh, typically uh, are not very uh, gratifying uh, because when we assess the bone uh, after a um, gunshot injury, uh, what we typically find is that uh, the pieces of bone are essentially uh, broken into multiple pieces, and I call it pulverization. And here I don't want to go too much ahead of the next talk on articular injuries, but this is an example of a patient who had a gunshot injury uh, that went uh, through the um, ankle and the hind foot, and we see how uh, the entire bone is essentially pulverized without any opportunity for any meaningful uh, reconstruction in most uh, surgeon's hands, and uh, this patient ultimately uh, underwent uh, placement of a hind foot uh, fusion nail, as well as fusion of the tibiotalar joint, the subtalar joint, as well as the talonavicular joint and the calcaneal cuboid joint. Risk of amputation uh, is mostly discussed among the high velocity injuries. In low velocity injuries, uh, the, this risk is uh, relatively low unless we have any other prevailing circumstances as uh, significant neurovascular injuries or miscompartment syndromes. But for high velocity injuries, uh, there's a risk that is um, still uh, relatively high and most of the experience is coming from uh, the military experience. This study over the US and the United uh, Kingdom uh, is reporting on uh, rates of amputation uh, between 15 and 20 percent, uh, which is also uh, confirmed uh, through the Civil War experience out of the study in Serbia. So high velocity uh, injuries, blast injuries, the risk of amputation is still relatively high between 15 and 20 percent, given the high energy imparted on the injured extremity. And with this, 
we are back to our 36-year-old male patient who was assaulted with a handgun with this isolated injury, who was neurovascularly uh, intact. And uh, now we know that a handgun injury is a low-velocity gunshot injury. Uh, so this patient also had an angiogram to rule out any associated uh, neurovascular injuries, and the angiogram showed a patent flow. And uh, this patient went intramedullary nail fixation, uh, as was indicated given the uh, femur fracture with a significant segmental uh, comminution. And another um, emphasis that I would like to make uh, in these gunshot injuries, what we frequently see also is delayed healing. And again, um, looking at it in surgery, when we explore these injuries, we see, frequently see um, the bone pulverized, several bony pieces stripped of the surrounding blood supply. And this probably also relates into delayed healing rates as well as higher uh, non-union rates. In summary, in the United States, we see an increasing uh, epidemiology of uh, both fatal and non-fatal firearm injuries. Uh, please make sure to distinguish between high velocity and low velocity injuries, completely different animal. Uh, we have a low threshold to get a CT angiogram. It is cheap, it is quick, and uh, it, is, it has low complication rates. Uh, we do not uh, recommend uh, routine exploration for bullet removal unless there are other prevailing circumstances such as subcutaneous uh, position of the bullet or uh, intraarticular involvement as uh, I'm sure will also be discussed in the next talk. And bridge plating and intramedullary nail fixation are the standard fixation constructs. And keep in mind that high velocity injuries, blast injuries uh, are typically at high risk for amputations. And with this, I would like to, again, um, thank everybody for the invitation and the opportunity uh, to present on this panel today. Thank you very much. There was a lot of information, I would say, um, and a few um, questions are being answered as we, as we speak here. I hope everybody can see. Uh, there's one remaining question. Why is C2, CT angio so important? Um, and what is, the, what is the role of examining the wound? Um. So uh, first question, why is CT angiogram uh, so important? I will say that um, the risk of uh, neurovascular injuries uh, with gunshot injuries is high. As I discussed, uh, for forearm injuries, uh, when we have high velocity injuries, that risk is nearly uh, 100%. And frequently also, uh, we see an a high um, association, uh, patients who have a vascular injuries uh, a vascular injury uh, that is typically associated with a nerve injury. And again, CT angiograms, they are quick to get and they provide uh, with that uh, useful information uh, that predicts the treatment. And uh, for that reason, we have a relatively low threshold. But again, I do not argue if you have a um, two plus uh, dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial pulse uh, and you feel comfortable um, uh, observing this patient, uh, you don't need a CT angiogram. That said, I will say, if uh, you decide to not get a CT angiogram, uh, I strongly uh, recommend close observation of any neurovascular changes. Um, the wound examination, um, uh, if that could be clarified, clinical wound examination or uh, wound exploration, um, what, what is the second question referred to? Um, what is the role of the, of the, as far as I understood the question, what is the role of the, can, or does it not replace uh, to do the CT angio? Okay. Uh, a CT angiogram does not uh, replace uh, the clinical exam. So uh, I'm not suggesting that a CT angiogram uh, will allow us uh, to uh, not obtain a, um, an appropriate uh, clinical uh, examination with pulse status um, and appropriate uh, ADIs. That should be, uh, that should be uh, part of the uh, initial assessment. Uh, that said, uh, if 
any concern, um, a CTO angiogram uh, should be widely available. Well, maybe another uh, subsequent question. Uh, let's imagine you don't have, uh, you're not in a level one uh, hospital and you don't have just one patient, you have more patients. Um, how can you how can you help uh, our colleagues to uh, do the decision making? Or maybe Professor Magungu has some ideas, uh, like he probably gets patients from some other hospitals as well. Uh, what 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 can you do if you don't have the diagnostic options? Well, um, I will uh, strongly suggest um, if you don't have the diagnostic options, quick transfer uh, to a level one trauma center. Me personally, I'm also uh, frequently taking call at community hospitals, and uh, I will say it is just to me more challenging managing a gunshot injury. Uh, out of a community hospital where you don't have the uh, diagnostic tools available as quickly. Frequently, uh, you have the diagnostic tools available, yet uh, they are not uh, activated uh, 24 hours a day. You may have the other services available, uh, yet uh, they are probably not as widely available um, as, at, uh, as they are at a level one trauma center where at night uh, the lights are on and... Um, a number of surgeons is waiting for the patient with gloves on and uh, ready to evaluate the patient. So um, taking call at community hospitals, uh, I have uh, also frequently suggested uh, transfers to a level one trauma center. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the patients that I showed, the 26-year-old um, who had the two bullet fragments, uh, I saw him at a community hospital and uh, I suggested transfer and they decided to keep him there, uh, but it was fairly frustrating for the ER physician as the general service, the interventional radiology service, the uh, vascular service just was not as widely available uh, and uh, ready at the bedside uh, as they are at a level one uh, trauma center. And um, as an orthopedic surgeon, uh, these are the resources uh, that we need uh, in order to take care of these. Okay, so one final question came just came in. Uh, how about external fixation before plating and I am nailing? Um, but then, then there was also uh, Professor Makungo wanted to say something. Uh, maybe if I can just quickly chip in on that question about um, which patients um, get transferred to a level one center. Look, we have a big gunshot problem in Cape Town. And if we saw every single gunshot patient in our hospital would have time for nothing else. So for us, if it's an isolated you know, tibia fracture, low velocity gunshot injury with a normal neurovascular examination, those ones get treated at our smaller hospitals. So the ones that come to us are basically, you know, if it's proximal femur, any gunshot around the elbow or around the knee where there's lots of concerns about um, neurovascular damage. So those ones come to us. And of course, anything involving the trunk, if there's time for transfer, they come to us. But like I said, humerus, uh, mid-shaft, tibia, mid-shaft, femur, mid-shaft, those ones don't come to us. Yeah. And I think that is important to point out, the culture and uh, the resources uh, certainly vary. And it is important to know uh, what do you have available and uh, what is the uh, culture of how the patient traffic is being routed? So having said that, I guess we, uh, we can now move on uh, to something that uh, at first glance looks uh, like some uh, particularly uh, special question, how to handle articular fractures. And um, there's a few answer, uh, questions left. Uh, so maybe you can uh, answer them online uh, in real time while we listen to the last talk. And uh, just uh, I wanted to mention that uh, the, the, we started with a little bit more than uh, 100 uh, uh, people that dialed in and now we are up to almost 140. So thank you very much. Now comes the big five. Mm. Alrighty, um, thank you once again to everyone for the opportunity to share um, our experiences uh, treating gunshot injuries.
So I'm Sitom Makungo, and um, I live and work in Cape Town. Just confirm if you can see my slides, please. Yes, we, we can, can see them. Alrighty, so we've all seen pictures of Cape Town. It's a beautiful city, uh, and I'm sure some of you have had the opportunity to, to come and visit us. And it's not, it's not only I say it's a beautiful city, most uh, travel websites in the world will agree with me. But unfortunately, Cape Town also has a, a dark side, and that dark side for us is um, gunshot injuries. We have um, a lot of uh, gangster violence, and so my talk really is about low velocity shoot injuries. There's going to be nothing on, um, on high velocity and certainly nothing on, on blast injuries. So um, we've seen some stats from, from the USA and this is how Cape Town compares to, you know, to some of the most dangerous cities in the world. So if you compare, for example, to, to Amsterdam, you know, our homicide rate is 65 per 100 uh, for population, which you know, for a city of uh, 4 million people, that, that's quite unacceptably high. Of course, you know, it's a bit lower compared to some of the um, cities in, in South America. So that's my hospital, uh, that's where I work. And um, our biggest fame, uh, claim to fame, of course, is that this is where the world's first heart transplant was performed. But of course, you know, we, like I said, we have a gunshot problem. So we see about 15,000 patients per year through our trauma unit. And this is just trauma, not including medical emergencies. And 10% of our work is now um, taken up by gunshot injuries. And pretty much like the stats from America, our figures are also going up now. And you know, so on a typical you know, weekend intake, we see images like this. And this is bilateral femur fractures, you know, upper limb injuries, another humerus you know, femur, 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 and um, just more injuries. And keep in mind that these are the ones that make it to hospital and specifically to our hospital, because like I said, many of them don't end up with us. So it's a, it's a massive problem um, that we are, you know, struggling to deal with just in terms of numbers, because they take up so much of our, our resources. Um, this is like a, from a couple of years ago, how many people were murdered over a weekend in Cape Town? It's abnormal for a country that is, you know, that is not at war. Of course, we are not alone. We saw the stats from America, but more worryingly, you know, it's a problem that is becoming more prevalent globally, and uh, it's important for for most surgeons around the world now to to be familiar with treatment of gunshot injuries. But like I said, the difference is that most of ours are low velocity. Whereas in a mass shooting, like we often see, you know, um, in the States and other places, those are, those are often high energy injuries. So mine isn't going to be a scientific talk, uh, but basically I'm just going to show you some clinical pictures just to try and show you what influences our approach and, um, and our philosophy um, with these injuries. So we are known as the big five country for our safari. You can come here to see the leopard. You can come and see the lion, the buffalo, elephant, and, and the black rhino. So this is the inspiration for my talk. That's why I termed it the big five. So what is the big five in articular injuries? Well, there's a couple of clinical scenarios. So the first scenario is when a bullet is lodged inside a joint, but there is no fracture. Second scenario is when the bullet is lodged inside a joint, but there are associated fractures. Next scenario is where the bullet has gone through the joint, so there's nothing retained uh, and there are no fractures. Next scenario is if you have a small bowel injury with an associated um, joint injury, and the last scenario is if you have a large bowel injury with an associated injury. So the first scenario is, um, you know, when you have a bullet that is lodged uh, in, uh, um, in the joint, but here there's no appreciable, you know, fracture to speak of. And, you know, the answer for this one is fairly simple. The bullet needs to be removed 
So that is the answer. And why do we remove bullets? Well, for a couple of reasons. Um, importantly, you know, to avoid infection, we remove them uh, to avoid um, lead arthropathy. And um, sometimes you can get absorption of the lead, the bullet, which can cause a systemic poisoning with lead, which is called plumbism. And of course, it's just a simple mechanical blockade caused by the bullet. So um, I spoke about lead arthropathy. This is an, an example of a patient with a juxta articular bullet. The bullet was never removed. And he presented with this uh, inflammatory type, but also quite a dry arthropathy. And when he went for total hip replacement, we then did a um, synovial biopsy and um, they could determine uh, or rather identify lead from the, from the synovium. Another example, you know, we want to remove it purely because there's mechanical blockade and you want to, to prevent third body wear. So this is another example of a bullet that would need to be removed and we can appreciate the problem if it is not removed. So there are various ways that we can remove the bullets. You can do a simple arthrotomy. It can be via arthroscopy. We have examples of a periarticular peri osteotomy and also surgical hip dislocation. So with, a, a th so with arthroscopy, so a bullet like this, this is lodged quite posterior in the knee joint and you can appreciate the anatomical difficulty in accessing this bullet from the posterior approach. So you can't get it from the anterior approach, but it can be accessed from the posterior approach. But the mobility that that would carry if you did this um, via open surgery is quite high. So this is an example of when arthroscopy um, becomes um, a useful tool to have for removal of bullets. Um, another example here. So why do we, certainly around the hip, you know, we prefer arthrotomy if we can compared to hip arthroscopy because arthrotomy is technically easier. There is no equipment required, um, certainly nothing specialized. And the downside, of course, is that it's an invasive procedure, but there's also limited access to the entire hip joint uh, as evidenced by this example here. So this is a bullet lodged posteriorly in the hip joint. And um, by just a simple posterior approach and arthrotomy, this is your trochanter and the capsulotomy, and there is the bullet visible. But of course, this requires quite proper surgical planning because you need to know the location of the bullet. And then there are some difficulties, of course, in trying to remove it via athros uh, arthrotomy only. This is an example of a bullet, again, in the right hip joint. So the bullet is free floating in the hip joint and you can see on the preoperative um, CT scan that it's sitting fairly anterior in the hip joint. So the plan for here was to go and do a dynamic hip screw and then remove the bullet from anterior. But of course they opened, as you can see here, Smith-Peterson approach, but they could not find the bullet. And then when we check the post-operative imaging, you can see it's migrated posteriorly. So you need to be careful if a bullet is free floating in the joint. Again, to remind you, that's where it was preoperatively. And then another example. So this is a, a juxta titular bullet. So here you can appreciate that it will be very difficult to remove this with arthroscopy because it's not easily accessible. Even if you did a surgical dislocation, you would remove some, uh, some cartilage to get to the bullet, which is quite destructive. So what we did for this one was to perform a simple posterior wall osteotomy access the bullet and take it out. And this is the, uh, the result at five years, uh, no infection, no AVN, and uh, no post-traumatic arthrosis. So many of you are wondering, what about hip arthroscopy? Yes, of course, arthroscopy is a possibility, but let's remember that um, hip arthroscopy is not widely available. You know, and certainly most of the centers where gunshot injuries are a problem are often in the less developed nations which don't have access to arthroscopy. The advantages of course would be that it is less invasive and there's a faster rehabilitation. But the downside is that it takes time to set up 
there's a very steep learning curve. And also the instrumentation you know, is, isn't really designed for removal of, um, of foreign bodies in the joint. And also there is a fairly limited um, access to the entire hip joint. So as a result, we don't use arthroscopy. Um, so what we do for bullets in and around the hip joint, we've published on this, but we do a surgical hip dislocation. And uh, we basically published our 10 patients and all of these are always young men in their 20s, and they were all shot through the ipsilateral buttock. Um, so that's a, just an example of the bullet sitting in the joint, X-ray and CT scan. And we gave them you know, preoperative antibiotics. And um, we took, so maybe to answer the question about infection, if there's no bowel involvement, we took a pus swab and sent it. And for all the cases, none of them returned anything positive. But importantly, we could access the entire hip joint and we could remove all the bullets. That's just an example of a surgical dislocation. That's the bullet just under, under the cartilage and the bullet has been removed. And that's where it is, which we then give to the law enforcement um, officers. And the other advantage with, um, with the surgical dislocation is that if there are any associated lesions, you are then able to address some of them this patient had a femur head fracture as well, and we could do um, uh, subchondral screws um, for this um, headless screws. And this is another, uh, this is the post-operative image with the surgical dislocation, as well as the screws for the femur head. Some patients, see so this one, they've lost cartilage of the femur head. And again, through the surgical dislocation, you can remove the bullet and then perform drilling to try and um, get fibrocartilage to cover the, 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 the cartilage defect. Um, sometimes, of course, you know, the bullet you know, will strike the hip joint and cross over into the acetabulum. Often those ones we don't treat operatively because it really, see, unlike blunt trauma, the fragment isn't displaced. It's just a hole through the fragment, but everything around it and the periosteum remains intact. So these ones we observe, but of course it's very difficult to know what the long-term outcome is because these patients are notorious for never coming for follow-up and it's, um, it's a worldwide problem if you look at the literature. And then the next scenario is a bullet that has gone through the joint, but there are no fractures to speak of, and there are no missiles that have been retained inside the joint. So this is another study that we did. We just basically just randomized prospectively patients with transarticular bullets. Half of them would be randomized to a formal washout, and the other half were not washed out. They were just given antibiotics. And, um, and unfortunately, you no, know, these are quite rare injuries. So it's very difficult to, to design a proper and, and a very well powered study. But um, from, from our study, we were trying to identify if it was safe to manage them non-operatively. And um, so like I said, we randomized them into two groups and our outcome was um, science of superficial or deep wound inspection uh, infection. So in the end, we had um, you know, um, 29, uh, 28 patients with 29 gunshot wounds. And in both groups, like I said, the ones were washed out and the other ones were not, and there was no infection. So of course, it was a very small study. And like I said, there's a very difficult patients to follow up. And there are other things that we did not assess, like a range of motion afterwards. We looked purely at uh, infection as an outcome. And also we didn't look at soft tissue lesions, potentially, you know, meniscus injuries. So we could conclude cautiously that if it's a low velocity gunshot wound and there's no indication for surgery other than the gunshot itself, then these patients can be managed non-operatively without a demonstrable risk of infection. It's a similar theme to what we saw from the first speaker, Valentine, that we don't have to operate on every case just because it's a, it's a gunshot wound. And I said, look, of course, it, it wasn't a very well-powered study, but these are very rare injuries. So if you look at infection rates in the literature, we would need to have 500 patients, 250 in each arm in order to get a properly designed study. And that's gonna be difficult to do.
And then what do we do when there's a fracture that's lodged in the joint and there's an associated fracture? So like I said here, if it's just a unicortical bridge, like we see in this femur here, it has gone through the femur. And so those fractures on their own, we don't treat in the same way that if it's an isolated posterior wall or posterior column, those ones we manage non-operatively. And like we saw from, um, from Boris's uh, uh, slide with the talus, some fractures are just unfixable. And this is an example of a you know, posterior femoral um, condyle, and it's just you know, shattered into pieces. And this is not technically fixable. So the decision here is whether to excise it or, or to leave it alone. But other fractures we treat on their merit. So if there's a complete fracture, then that requires fixation. Another example in a proximal tibia, it's going through the joint and through the proximal tibia, we then treat the tibia um, on its own merit. And um, like I've shown previously, if there's an associated head fracture, we then treat that. But now the, the problem with any gunshot, of course, involving the neck of femur is that the results with fixation are very disappointing. I mean, we know that closed fractures you know, um, in, in this group um, are called you know, the unsolved fracture. It's even more of a problem in gunshot injuries. And that's because of the combination that, you, that you're faced with uh, or that you encounter surgically. And this is, the, you know, this is basically what you typically get. They fail, well, whether it's through AVN or non-union and collapse into virus, but the results are just universally disappointing. Another one with the DHS that's cut out. We've tried plating and the plate here is also uh, failing. Uh, another one uh, that we treated with the DHS and the derotation screw. You follow all the principles, you reduce as anatomically as you can, apply the derotation screw, but the risk of failure is still high. And you can see this is now collapsing and it's gonna go into AVN and, um, and collapse. So what we've started doing now, again, uh, for necrophema intracapsula is we've started so there are newer plates available on the market and most of the manufacturers have got similar plates. So this is you know, a fairly new thing that we do. So I'm hoping to be able to present this um, at some point once you've accumulated enough numbers. But um, you know, so often though, what we do for this is that we end up just taking this out, of course, and doing a hip replacement. We've got a few patients where we do primary replacement because it is just, like I said, not technically fixable. But luckily, we still, you know, we still try and give them you know, and fix them and hopefully we'll have better results with the newer implants. And then there's a place, of course, for cannulated screws if the fracture pattern warrants that kind of fixation. And then lastly, if there's any contamination with a hollow viscous, so here we differentiate between small bowel and large bowel. If it's a small bowel contamination, then we give them just um, prophylactic. Uh, in fact, we don't even treat them with antibiotics. We just treat the wound only with just wound toilet and, and a dressing because the, the morbidity and infection rates are low. In fact, they're negligible with small bowel. But if it's a large bowel injury like this one here, then, then we always remove it. And the results with large bowel contamination are not great. You know, this is another example. You can see there's a large bowel injury. There was a rectal injury here, and the bullet is lost in the joint. So what we did at first was to you know, do what we do, wash it out and, um, and remove the bullet. But they just kept coming to care to with more and more sepsis. And this is where now you know, um, discussions like whether you know, you do a, cause all of them will get a defunctioning colostomy, but things like a distal stump wash out of the rectum because when you remove the bullet, the communication with the distal rectum is still intact, you know, so that maybe they're still seeding from the, from the rectum. So just a simple algorithm that we do. So like I said, if there's an extra peritoneal uh, rectal injury, then they get a defunctioning stoma but uh, the, our surgeons don't repair, the, the, they don't do primary anastomosis. And then if there's a joint involvement, we always wash out the track and we remove all intraticular missiles and we give them um, antibiotics.
This is an example of what we often get. Yeah, this is just terrible osteitis around the hip. They get it inside the pelvis and it just forever keeps draining outside. It's a big problem. Fortunately, it's quite a rare injury. So it should be very difficult once again to have like a comprehensive answer for this. So we treat them on a case by case basis. And just lastly, an example of what we did for the last one we had. This is a retained bullet with a large bowel injury. So we they had a divesting colostomy, but we just we did a distal stump washout, did a surgical bullet removal, sorry, bullet removal through a surgical dislocation. And then this is now what you get. So you can remove the bullet from the hip joint, but the hole is still communicating with the distal rectum. So then I then put them supine and did a uh, anterior intrapelvic or stopper approach. And I plug the hole with cement. So now I put cement on the inside to prevent the bowel contents from entering the hip joint. It's one case of, of um, a very rare injury. And I don't know if this is the answer, but at least we are trying to find solutions. So to summarize, so like I said, these injuries can be treated non-operatively. And uh, if they are retained inside the joint, they need to be removed. And surgical hip dislocation allows you to remove all the bullets and you can treat associated injuries. And any fractures must be treated on merit. And some fractures are unfortunately technically unfixable. And fixation of femur head and neck fractures yields, um, yields very poor results. And small bowel contamination does not require formal washout. And um, large bowel contamination has potentially bad outcomes, but luckily um, they are quite unusual injuries. And, and like I said, these patients are notoriously very difficult to follow up. So it makes it difficult to, to have like long-term outcomes. So yeah, to, to summarize, those are the five scenarios that make up the big five. And thank you once again for the opportunity to present. Well, thank you very much. That was kind of spectacular. I was uh, <clears throat> particularly puzzled about uh, your results that you showed from uh, femoral neck fractures. And so um, my personal question to you would be, do you think uh, the, the problems to get these fractures to heal, do they derive from the fact that um, the bullet uh, has, uh, has injured the artery? Or, or how can we explain this? I mean, they're really particularly bad, aren't they? Yeah, no, like I said, they are universally bad. So look, there are three reasons, I think. So one of them may well be um, damage to the, to the blood vessels. But of course, we don't do angiography to, to diagnose that. And even if you did angiography, you can't really repair the vessel. So that may be one, one reason for the avascular necrosis. But the other thing I think is just because there's just so much comminution that we see. So most of the, of the implants that we use are designed for closed fractures. And even the, you know, the comminution you get in closed fractures is not as extensive as you get in the in the gunshot injuries. So I think that the answer lies that, you know, there are some things we can control and some that you can't control. Damage to the blood supply, we cannot control, but I think people who are, you know, able to talk to or, you know, uh, speak to engineers about maybe better implants, or because at the moment, you know, for anything that is subcapital, uh, we don't even bother trying to fix it because we know those ones will fail. So we do a primary joint replacement but like I said, there's a 24 or 25 year olds. So ideally you should not be replacing, but rather should be, you should be fixing. Thank you very much. I think this was a wonderful and spectacular overview of uh, this particular problem. I would now like to hand back to Jonathan um, to conclude this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. I hope you've enjoyed this webinar and that you'll join us again in two weeks time when we'll be looking at penetrating buttock injuries and their management. Don't forget that we'll put up the address for you to send medical equipment for our colleagues in Ukraine at the end of this webinar. And it just remains for me to thank our panelists, Valentin Newhouse, Boris Zell,
Sitongo Makungo and my co-host uh, Chris Pape uh, for the webinar. I'd also like to thank our webinar team of Diego Mariani, Alan Miloslavo, Hayati Curiara and Mauro, Z Mauro, Mauro Zago um, for joining us uh, today. As I say, I hope you've enjoyed this webinar. It has been very useful, I think, uh, for a lot of people. And uh, with that, I will wish you a good night. <laughs>